Okay, guys, so we're starting now. Uh, we have uh, over 30 people on our webcast throughout the world, so that's good. Uh, this is our first uh, meetup over here in this office, and we'll have a series of them over the next few months and going forward. Uh, and before we start our meetup, a shout out to Ample, the sponsor of the visa. And thanks to Ample. Today, we're going to have two talks uh, one from Capital One, Ilya, uh, talking about next generation decision making under two milliseconds, and second by Brian from Hotworks, how to integrate an i5 with uh, Apex. So, with that, uh, I think it works. Yeah. Can you hear me? Right, I'm talking. Hi guys, so my name is Ilya. I am part of the Vault 8 team. I'm a data engineer uh, in Capital One. And broadly speaking, our team is a data innovation lab. And so our role is to go out, find the latest and greatest technologies, and bring them in-house to solve business problems. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, arguably one of the hardest problems that we face as a business, and that's how do we very quickly make decisions on the data that we consume. Uh, to that end, we went through an extensive evaluation and investigation process to essentially figure out what is the right solution for the problem that we have at hand. And this talk is the story of that process. Okay. Let's try that again. All right. So, Broadly speaking, uh, big data gets thrown around a lot, fast data gets thrown around a lot. Uh, I'm going to take a second and actually define what I mean when I talk about these things. As far as big data goes, in my mind, what we're really talking about here is just the sort of stereotypical batch processing. We have a bunch of data that's landed somewhere in memory, on a cluster, uh, on disk, what have you, and we can apply sort of our traditional methods to operating on this data. Now. Scaling out to process more data is still hard, right? You still have to sort of go through the exercise of figuring out how do you add more machines, how do you have these machines communicate efficiently, and how do you deal with limitations of something like the JVM when you're worrying about scaling out. But the one thing that you don't have to really worry about is how long it takes you to actually process this data. Typically, when you're dealing with batch processing, you're not going to have sort of a critical guarantee that you must provide a response in a very small window. So you might need to get a response out in a matter of seconds or in a matter of minutes, but it's a lot easier to work on those timescales than when you're working on timescales of microseconds or single digit milliseconds. We have to have a use case where we do need to work on that timescale, where we need to generate a response in under 15 milliseconds for any single transaction that we see in our system. And this means that we're in a second run. We're in the realm of streaming. And in streaming, we're not operating on chunks of data at a time. We're really operating on one piece of data at a time as it comes in and becomes available to us. And this distinction matters because if you consider a batch of data that you process, the very first tuple that you consume is going to be waiting for the other 499 pieces of data that come in before that batch of 500 actually gets processed. And what that means is that the time it takes to generate a response for that very first piece of data is potentially very long. Because not only do you then need to operate on that batch, but you also need to wait for all the other pieces of data to arrive. In contrast, in stream processing, as a piece of data becomes available, it immediately gets fed through the pipes, operated on, and you get a result out. Now the challenge here is that we can't simply say, oh well, we can just take a little longer to process this. right? We want to throw a few more algorithms at it. Because if we do that, we're going to increase the complexity of the system, and we might exceed the time window that we have. What this means is that, realistically speaking, the only way that we really deal with the challenge of processing a lot of data in the streaming fashion is that we have to scale out. And so the question of how efficiently and how easily can we scale out in a way that still maintains the reliability of the system, and makes it easier to deploy it in an enterprise environment, that actually proves to be the hardest challenge. The sort of traditional solution to how one does this is that one essentially throws money at IBM. You buy mainframe hardware. These are specialized computers, highly optimized. All your code runs on these arguably restricted machines, so you have a very limited, uh, essentially, set of functionality available to you. But these machines are blisteringly fast, and they never break. Right? On the flip side, you've got the open source world. And open source offers a whole wealth of advantages in its own right. You can customize the code to do whatever it is that you want to do. You have the ability to grow the project organically. But you are almost never going to get the same degree of reliability or performance 
that you'll get from a system that's built for production and that came from an environment where if things break, you're going to get sued for millions of dollars. So the biggest advantage that you really have from these mainframes, as far as a business is concerned, is this notion of availability. For everything that happens on these systems, you have a strict contractual guarantee called an SLA of what that system must deliver in terms of performance. Now, the key metric as far as we're concerned is this measure of downtime. Essentially, what fraction of time in a year will this system be out of commission and unable to produce a response when data arrives? And we care so much about this because any time that we do not generate a response to an incoming request, we're sacrificing all of the investment that we've made into creating the systems that respond to that request because something upstream of us will just make that decision for us. In this realm of mainstream computing, your measure of how performing your system is in terms of availability is typically measured in nines. And what these systems guarantee us typically is at least five nines of availability, meaning that in a single year, you'll have just barely over five minutes of unplanned downtime. You've also got systems like S3, which actually guarantee nine nines of availability for comparison, which means that for all intents and purposes, these are never down systems. To get this, you pay a lot. Now, with open source technology, there's a massive advantage, first and foremost for the business, because it's free. Right? If you can get this thing to work, that's a huge payoff in its own right. Secondly, these systems are notably more flexible. You don't have to go to IBM or Oracle or somebody else and try to convince them to add some feature to the product that benefits your business specifically, but may or may not affect anybody else. They're not going to care unless you're a giant paying customer. With open source, if you have the know-how and the familiarity, you can go and build it yourself. And in a lot of ways, this allows you to future-proof whatever you design on top of these systems. And that's a critical sort of goal when the ultimate objective is to build systems that last well into the future, where our solution to problems is not simply to just throw more money at it. Now, what we do today is we have data come in. We are a credit card company. Somebody swipes their credit card. And we have something called a model. And a model is merely uh, a box that makes a decision for us, given some set of input data. And I'll dive into, into uh, I'll dive into in a moment what that means in a little more detail. These things get fed into a mainframe, and then we throw money at the problem and hope that it goes away. Now, the issue here is that at some point, it's questionable whether we're throwing an appropriate amount of money at the problem or whether we can come up with a better solution that is a little more future-proof than being utterly dependent on outside providers of hardware and of software that makes decisions for us. Now, a model is merely something that given some input data, so in our case, say, the spend amount for a transaction, and generates a response. Uh, in this case, say, we want to predict the likelihood that you're a millionaire. And we might want to do this, for example, if we want to offer you a bigger credit line. Now, the features that actually power this model are sort of the signal that we create from the data. And in our case, we have three real classes of features. The first we call simple features. These are pieces of data that are present directly in the transaction as we receive it from the upstream provider. Right? This is going to be something like the date of the transaction, the location, the merchant, pretty much the basic stuff that you'd expect. You might be able to get some useful predictions out of that, but what has substantially more value is a second class of features, what we call velocity features. And these are aggregates over time. Now, you can think about this as the amount of money you spent at a particular store, or the sort of distribution of how you spend money over geographic regions. Right? So if you're normally buying lots of things in Maryland and all of a sudden you're spending in Texas, then that's a wonky situation. Now, the consequence of needing to aggregate data over time is that all of a sudden, in our stream processing solution, where data is coming in one piece of data at a time, we now need to maintain a notion of state. And we need to efficiently aggregate this data over time and be able to query it quickly 
because we still can't exceed this very tight latency window that we have. To that end, this data gets stored in an in-memory database. And now, the reason that this has to be in memory is if you're familiar with sort of the latencies associated with the disk read, if you hit hard disk, you're already incurring a 100 millisecond penalty. So a lot of frameworks will not worry about this because they don't have these very small latency windows to worry about. So for Kafka, for example, to ensure durability, they're backed to HDFS, which means they can always replay from HDFS in the event of a failure. But if we have to replay from disk, we're, we, we lose. We're, we're already not able to make a decision within our live latency window. So everything we do essentially must happen in memory. A last class of features that we consider is something we call advanced features. And these are features that combine multiple sources of data and distributions of data over time. For example, this can be the amount that you spend in a particular geographical region as a function of time. Right? So these are more complex aggregates. And for this third class of features, depending on the time scale, it may actually be okay to aggregate these in batch form and load these into the in-memory data store to be queried right away. So in a sense, we have a system combining a lot of different kinds of data and different ways of operating on the streaming data so that we can ultimately make a decision quickly. So what is the in-memory database you're using? I'll get to that. Uh, I can address that now. The in-memory database that we're using at the moment is HDHT. It's a memory store built into the proprietary offering of Data Torrent, um, not baked into Apex. We've also built a solution on top of Redis, um, demonstrated similar scalability. Um, but I would like to do at the end of the talk is dive into in a little more detail why we are using HHT at the moment and what our goal is sort of for the long term to avoid being dependent on a proprietary piece so of you technology. No, no Hazelcast. We did evaluate Ignite as another comparable compute grid um, for yeah. doing some of this. I'm sorry? You did the Apache Ignite? Yes, we looked okay. at Ignite early on. And how did it go? Not so well. Oh? <laughs> no. um, but again, we're getting a little sidetracked, so I'd like to keep things rolling. Uh, where we are right now is that we have a system that is extremely stale because, again, Updating the system costs lots of money, meaning that we don't update the system very frequently. When the system is stale and the models that it executes are stale and out of date, we can't really make good decisions. And so at some point, the refresh cycle rolls around and we ask ourselves, can we not do this whole thing better? Can we not get out of this terrible swamp, <coughs> stop throwing money at the situation, and actually wind up in a place where we're happy with the system that we have? So this is all well and good. Uh, we are ultimately, however, building something for the business. So we have to do more than just find the latest, sexiest technology, make a prototype, say, hey, guys, it's going to go do great. Just throw a 1,000 nodes at it on AWS. Everything will be dandy. It doesn't really work that way, especially when you're trying to sell things to a bank where their primary motive is to avoid risk at every uh, point in turn. So everything that we do has to have a rigor associated with it. We must essentially prove that whatever solution we pick makes sense both from an engineering perspective, from an architectural perspective, and that it's feasible to deploy within the enterprise. This is the only bit of actual hard text on here. And the, I want to just highlight a few things here that, at first glance, might not seem like that crazy of a deal, but are actually critically important. We've already talked about our latency constraints. The second bit. So this, this goal of 2,000 events per second right, is laughably small. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that that's a lot of data. But the thing to keep in mind is that this is the raw data that's coming in. And as this raw data comes in, on top of this raw data, we need to compute features. We need to retrieve features from memory. right? We need to compute and retrieve more advanced features. We need to update all of the pieces in memory that we're maintaining in terms of aggregates. Right? And ultimately, we need to feed all these into a model, make a decision, score it, validate it, so that over time we can track when our model performance degrades and we know when we need to deploy new models, and then ultimately return a response. And now, all of this still needs to happen within that latency window. And what you actually see is that these 2,000 events blow up, and these turn into hundreds of thousands and millions of events in their own right. So this number, which at first seems really small, in reality blossoms very quickly. 
Now, we've talked about the importance of availability. If we want to replace a mainframe, if we're building something on open source technology, then we have to meet these same requirements for availability and durability. We cannot lose any of the data going through the system, and we can't exceed our latency window. And the last bit, and I've spoken to this, is this notion of scalability. That as we need to process more data, as we want to grow sort of the problems that we're able to tackle with the system, then whatever it is that we select, we should be able to add resources without having system performance degrade. And that's really the only sort of measure of scalability that matters. Like, your ultimate goal is, right, you have a, a, a linear relationship, right? You can add 10 times as many nodes, and you'll get 10 times as much performance. The, the sad reality of it is that you're going to get maybe 5 or X or 6X performance because of all the complexities of building a larger system. But the degree to which it's easier to operationalize such a system and keep it running, that's ultimately what drives its sort of long-term success. And the last bit, and I've worked on this enough, but sort of soft metrics. These are things that came not from the business, but from ourselves as a team, is that we really did want this thing first and foremost to be built on open source as much as possible. To future-proof it so that we're able to take our learnings and give them back to the community. And so that this framework is extensible, updatable, dynamic, and never we never wind up in the situation in the future where we're stuck and our only solution is to throw a lot more money at the problem to make it go away or to launch a massive engineering effort to fix it. So how do we actually get out of this swamp that we find ourselves in? And the only true answer to here is that you must consider all the things. So Hazelcast is up there. We did look into Hazelcast. We didn't run it to the same extent that we ran some of these other frameworks. This is a small subset of all the things that we've looked at in terms of streaming frameworks, uh, in-memory databases, compute grids. Uh, of all of these, there's only a few really that stood out for our particular use case, and I'll dive into specifically which ones those are later. <coughs> But the more important question is, how do we actually compare these? And first and foremost among this, anything we select has to meet our performance requirements. We have to meet our requirements in terms of availability, durability, latency. And the system must scale. Second to that is that this system must, in its present state, be ready for deployment in the enterprise. And now, this is kind of a tricky thing to actually define. But realistically speaking, what it means is that we can take this we can take our prototype and we can go to the leaders of our business who do not want to take risks because risk is expensive. And we have to tell them, this is not a risk. This is proven. We can guarantee that this will work. And of all of the things that we have to show, that's the hardest, right? That is the hardest thing to quantify. That's the hardest thing to convince somebody else of. To build on this, if we want a future proof Whatever it is that our solution is, we have to consider how it's going to evolve into the future. And that means looking at its roadmap. And this is both the published roadmap for this technology, as well as actually interacting with the folks behind it to understand where they're taking it and what they're building. Because a lot of the times, especially with open source projects backed by proprietary companies, private companies, this isn't necessarily public information. So to the extent able, we try to figure out, even if the technology is not there, where will it be a year from now? two years from now. And the reason we want to do this is that, A, you know, you know, if we're putting all our eggs in this basket of a particular tool, we don't want this tool to go away from us and move in a direction that we can't really benefit from. And the last bit that sort of ties all of this together is the community around the project, especially in the open source realm. A project lives and breathes by the people that support it and that help build it. And again, if your community moves away from you, you're going to be stuck maintaining a piece of code that nobody else is working with, new tools are gonna to come out that aren't gonna interface with it, and you'll be stuck holding a piece of dead wood. And so anything that we selected, we wanted to make sure that it has a vibrant and active engagement amongst a broad and diverse population. Now, the upshot of this entire discussion is that of all the things we looked at, Apex was the only thing to fit the bill. And I'm not gonna just sit up here, tell you that, and then walk away. I'm hopefully gonna actually convince you of that fact. And to do that, we're going to look through the main sort of runners up. We're going to consider Storm. We're going to consider Spark Streaming as kind of the elephant in the room. 
and we're going to look at Flink as the final and best alternative to date that we've seen to Apex. So first and foremost, uh, I'm throwing Spark up here not because it's necessarily a viable solution, but because it's what everyone knows and I think to some degree understands better than any of the other tools up here. And Spark Streaming in particular is not really a true streaming solution. So under the hood, Spark Streaming is doing what is called micro-batching, meaning that it's taking the input data, it's waiting for enough of that input data to come in to reach a predefined interval of time or size, and then it is running that mini-batch, which may be a couple seconds or a few hundreds of milliseconds, on the underlying Spark framework that uh, does what Spark normally does, uh, move some data around, gets it all into the right memory space, does some computation, writes it out to disk. Now, the consequence of this is that all of Spark's internal machinery is still in the loop. And even if you can reduce the duration of this micro-batch as you can in newer versions of Spark, that machinery starts getting in the way, especially when you get down into levels of hundreds of microseconds. And pretty much in practical terms, you cannot really use Spark streaming for applications less than half a second of duration um, in terms of latency. Now, the consequence of this is that if we wanted to build our tool on top of Spark, we could simply not meet our latency requirements. With that said, Spark is still a fantastic tool as far as quick and dirty ETL, rapid iteration with machine learning algorithms, and simply moving data back and forth in and out of various systems. And to that end, that is what we use it for. So in our ultimate solution, Spark powers one of these advanced features that we're talking about. We compute this feature in Spark, load it into memory, and subsequently consume it with Apex. Now, of the three true streaming solutions, each is different in their own right. And uh, Storm up here is kind of the, uh, the legacy solution, but it's also the most proven, right? It's been around for ages, deployed in production all over the place, blisteringly fast, it works, it's easy to use. I will dive into why it's not quite right for us. That said, still great piece of technology. Flink is a much younger project, younger than either Storm or Apex, but uh, very well designed, a bunch of smart people behind it, active and growing community, and they are doing a really great job of essentially explaining why they are a true competitor to Spark and why they're a great streaming solution. And part of this is that they have a really robust system for error handling that does not cause some of the same problems that Storm runs into. And last of all in here, we have Apex, and I'm not going to talk about it right now because I'm going to dive into in detail what makes Apex special after we talk about the others. So Storm is a technology that uh, was acquired early on by Twitter and primarily driven by Twitter for a long time. Uh, what's interesting is that Twitter ultimately moved away from Storm uh, in favor of Heron. That's something that happened earlier, uh, or towards the tail end of last year, I guess. And the reason that they did this is because they ran into issues executing Storm in production environments, especially at scale. And uh, part of the reason there is that essentially different Storm applications would not play well in the same cluster. And they ran into issues with resource sharing, uh, amongst other things. The way that Storm works is you create topologies or connected graphs of operators. And in Storm, you have two kinds of operators. You have a uh, you have essentially a source operator called spout, and you have bolts, which are operators that consume the source data, do some operations on it, and pass it on to other bolts in the topology. Now, the reason I mention this is because in order to understand how Storm handles failure scenarios, you kind of need to have a better, uh, some semblance of the structure. Now, in a failure scenario, say for example you lose a node, you're going to lose the operators, the bolts or spouts that are deployed on that node. The way the Storm handles these failures is that when a spout initially uh, produces data and emits it into the topology, it'll also transmit, um, a, it'll wait for an acknowledgement signal to come back from everything downstream that needs to consume that piece of data. Now, the way the storm detects a failure is when this acknowledgement never comes back. And one of the first problems that you run into with storm is that 
you can't actually configure this acknowledgement window to be less than one second. So what this means is that you can't detect a failure any sooner than one second. Now, in of itself, this isn't a disaster, right? Uh, what you can do is you can create three separate pipelines all processing the same piece of data, such that if any one of those pipelines fails, then the other two pipelines will still be doing the same work, and you can get a response from one of those. Now, uh, this would work great in theory, except that unfortunately in Storm, because everything ultimately comes back to that same spout, and that spout needs to go back and replay, you have to reset the state of the entire topology. Meaning that the only way to actually create this independent, durable structure, where you have these separate pipelines processing the same data to be independent of each other, you actually need to deploy separate storm applications. Which, unfortunately, brings us to the situation that Twitter found themselves in, where they're deploying a multitude of large storm applications on extremely large clusters, but these applications were all competing for resources and competing with each other um, just for compute and not able to operate efficiently. And the consequence of this was that they ended up redesigning Storm fundamentally to avoid a lot of these issues uh, and they built their own resource manager to replace the sort of default manager that uh, Storm has to get around this. Now, what this means is that for the sake of scalability and fault tolerance, it's a lot harder to actually operationalize Storm. So that was kind of the initial strike against Storm. Now, a second bit that matters is we've talked about this notion of dynamism in the topologies. We want these topologies to be reconfigurable and we want them to be dynamically scalable. And there's two reasons for this. We want these topologies to be reconfigurable because we want to be able to deploy living and breathing models that we can update either the model or the features that power them we need to be able to reconfigure the graphs that actually represent the execution of our system. Secondly, as we want to process more data, as we want to add features to the system, necessarily we have to do more computation. And again, we talked about us being in a streaming environment, meaning that we can't just take longer to process. This means that we have to scale out. And having the ability to scale out dynamically <coughs> means that as we encounter periods of heavy load or uh, if we have certain transactions that require a wider feature set, we can dynamically adjust our system to compensate for these changes. Storm does not, in its present form, support any of the sort of dynamism. You cannot dynamically scale it, and you cannot dynamically reconfigure these topologies. These are both things that are on the long-term roadmap for Hortonworks, for supporting Storm, but these aren't things that are available today. The last bit, is that as far as the community for Storm goes, Storm has a, had a very vibrant and active community for a long time. Today, folks have moved away from it. There's not a wide sort of industrial backing for Storm. Hortonworks is, realistically speaking, the only uh, true powerhouse behind it. Yahoo has one or two committers that are active for Storm, but there's not sort of a broad user base continuing to support Storm, and folks are definitely moving in the direction of newer technologies. The consequence of this is that it's difficult to sell the notion of a technology that's been around for a while, but is in a lot of ways kind of growing stale, and whose community is becoming equally stale and unmotivated to continue improving the product when it comes time to actually argue for deploying this thing into business. So I am one slide behind. I apologize for that. We should be at this slide. Now, moving on, uh, next in our lineup we have Flink. Flink is a technology that came relatively recently uh, out of a group, I think, in Germany. Um, a, uh, it's actively used and sort of uh, experimented with in research institutions all over Europe, so there's a pretty broad presence there. And uh, at its core, it's based around the same idea as Apex and as Storm. You create connected DAGs of operators, data flows through these operators, gets routed appropriately. Now, what sets Flink apart from Storm from the get-go is that they have a much different mechanism for handling failure. In Flink, uh, what they do is they inject what they call, uh, I, I believe, buffers into the data as it flows through the system. And these buffers are replicated to every operator throughout the system. And in the event of a uh, failure, you essentially track back to the previous buffer and only have to replay from there. Now, as these buffers flow through the system, a, uh, Flink 
takes checkpoints. These checkpoints are stored to disk. And Flink is able to quickly and rapidly reload these checkpoints from disk in the event of a failure. Now, the consequence of this is that there's no notion of waiting for an acknowledgment from uh, a piece of data flowing through the entire topology before hitting a failure and waiting for that response. So its failure handling is much faster than Storm's. And they do demonstrate that when they turn on failure handling in Flink, um, the equivalent to Storm's acknowledgment framework, they do not take a performance hit whatsoever in terms of latency and TEM through the system. Now, the thing is, however, that this failure mechanism still requires a upstream data provider to persist the data that Flink will replay. And what this means is that it has to go back to something like a Kafka upstream that will be a source of ground truth for the data that it needs to replay. Now, the other bit is that, like in Storm, in these failure scenarios, Flink has to reset the entire topology to the appropriate state to ensure consistency. The consequence of this is, again, that we don't have an easy way to create durable independent pipelines in the same system. Now, in terms of roadmap, Flink is presently working on adding dynamic scalability in terms of both sort of the physical partitions associated with each operator that allow it to process more data simultaneously, and on adding reconfigurable modules for uh, its DAX. Again, this is <laughs> on the roadmap, not presently available. Uh, as far as what Flink does well in its present state, they have a much better API that's much easier to use, truth be told, than Apex's, right? This is an intuitive declarative API Sim similar to Sparks, uh, and quite frankly, they've been positioning themselves as competitors to Spark, both in the streaming realm and in the batch space, and with good reason, right? They're a fundamentally sounder and more scalable architecture than that uh, proposed by Spark. However, when it comes to sort of guaranteeing performance in failure scenarios and being enterprise ready, we did not feel comfortable as a team in actually presenting that to the business. Unlike Storm, which has provenly been deployed in a large number of production environments, Flink to date has only one customer that actually runs Flink in production. Uh, there are others, there are a number of other companies that use Flink in pre-production, meaning that they use it for ETL tasks, but they're not using it for critical workloads. And when we're coming to the leaders of our business and we're saying, hey guys, we want to run all of our transactions through this system. We can't offer them a system that hasn't been provably deployed in a business environment to date. Flink's community is young. It has generated a substantial amount of popularity recently. It's growing rapidly. They actually do a fantastic job of marketing themselves, and they do a really good job of communicating both what the framework is capable of and of describing exactly how it works, what it's good for. So to that end, I think they do a really good job which is, quite frankly, why Flink is a very serious contender in sort of the space of solutions that we looked at. But again, because our goal is ultimately to identify something that we can take to the business and have it be ready for deployment today, right, given our proven prototype, we simply couldn't back Flink in the state that it is today. And this brings us to our last uh, contender, and that is Apex. Um, Apex is a technology that came out of Yahoo Finance. At Yahoo Finance, this was built by the team uh, behind Yarn and Hadoop, where we have a number of them in this room. We've got them all and we've got Foo. Uh, they can tell you a lot more about this later if you're interested. But in short, they were ingesting data from all over the globe, compiling it, doing data analytics on this data. And the system was built from the ground up to be reliable and to never fail. It was not built necessarily for performance. That was kind of a secondary objective. The first and foremost goal was that data should not be lost and the system should not break. And this puts uh, Apex, which came out of this sort of closed environment, in a unique position. In the, of the technologies we've looked at, it's really the only one that was built first and foremost 
for the business world and was then open sourced. And we can sit here, I think, and debate all, all day long whether it's better to have a technology that grows organically from the community or something that came from the business world and was open sourced as a ready-made solution. But the one thing that is certain is that it's a lot easier to bring something to a business and say, hey, here's a workable solution when it came from the business world. In Apex, as I mentioned, you create the same kind of workflow that you do in both Storm and Flink. You create a, a DAG of operations. Data flows through these operators. Uh, you can support you know, multi-input, multi-output design patterns. Um, data will get replicated appropriately. The part that I really want to mention here is, is this piece at the bottom. And you don't need to ex understand this explicitly, but what's happening here is that we're actually dynamically modifying this topology to add an additional operator. Now, Apex is the only technology that we've looked at to date that supports this level of interface in its present state with a live system. And this happens without sacrificing the stateful processing that's happening within that system. The second bit is that Apex does support this dynamic scaling that I've talked about, and we'll dive into that a little bit later. What an actual Apex cluster looks like is you have a, uh, a YARN system. Apex integrates arguably more natively with YARN than anything else out there, again, being built specifically by the same folks that designed these systems to run on these systems. At the top level, we have this uh, RTS app master. This is sort of a, a coordinating entity that tracks the heartbeat of the system and is responsible for sending a signal to restart any failed operations. This is itself a replicated process. It's not just a single entity, so there are there is a failover there should there be a need for it. And then on every node in your cluster, you may have one or more containers. Each one of these containers may have one or more operators. and uh, the really interesting thing here is that in Apex, unlike in any of the other solutions that we've looked at, you also have the ability to actually specify the locality of execution. Now, what this means is that you can configure operators to be on the same node, you can configure operators to be in the same container, you can configure operators to be in the same thread. And the importance of this is that if operators are on different nodes, anytime you want to pass data between them, you're going to have a network hop as well as the price of a context switch between the memory spaces. They're in different containers. You're not paying that network cost, but you are going to pay the price to switch context. And if they're in the same thread, the only price that you're paying is the same price that you would pay to make a function call within <coughs> that application in that memory space. And what this means is that if you flip this on its head and you say, hey, I, now I can define affinity, but I also want to be able to define anti-affinity. I want to be able to say, OK, I want to guarantee that these operators run in different nodes. Then, not only can we specify a performance metric that gives us better latency by running everything within the same thread, but we can simultaneously configure the system to be durable. Coupled with the last bit that I haven't mentioned yet, and that is how Apex handles failures, what we can actually do is these durable independent pipelines that I've been talking about, processing the same data, we can actually build them within the same application in Apex, and we can deploy these, and as a matter of configuration, make the system scalable and reliable. The way that Apex doesn't suffer the same sort of limitations as far as failure handling goes as the other systems that we've looked at, where they have to reset the entire topology to source, is that for every pair of operators in Apex that reside in different containers, they actually have a buffer between them. Uh, the technical name is a buffer server. And this buffer server sits at the output of the first operator, and it acts essentially as a Kafka for any upstream operators that connect to that operator. So in the event of a failure, you never have to go any further back than to that buffer server, which is persisting this data in memory, as well as durably backing it to disk. The consequence of this is that we never have the situation where we have to reset the entire topology in the case of a failure. And we can create these three durable independent pipelines within the same application, which dramatically simplifies deployment and operational maintenance. And we don't have to worry about resource conflicts 
of different applications running in the same environment. The last bit is that Apex does support this dynamic scaling that I've been talking about in terms of physically scaling out the number of partitions available to process the data flowing through the system. So each one of these separations <coughs> represents the same logical processes being applied to different pieces of physical data. And Apex supports dynamically adjusting these based on statistics computed in flight at runtime. So you can scale based on throughput, you can scale based on latency through your operator, you can scale based on whatever else you want to scale on. But the point of this is that as your system runs, it will automatically adjust to different loads and to different challenges without sacrificing, uh, without requiring direct involvement by a sysadmin or recompiling the program and redeploying it to your cluster. The last bit, and this is something that's in here because we use it, not because it's necessarily critically important for the sake of actually understanding why the system is valuable. But as data flows through the system in Apex, you have this notion of windows on top of this data. These are not injected into the data in the way that they are with Flink, but they serve a very similar sort of idea, which is essentially that you can take a windowed view of this data as it flows through the system, and then you can actually perform computations like micro-batch and batch computations the way that you would in Spark or in Flink on the system. The advantage of doing this is that a lot of machine learning algorithms and a lot of analytics, things like join, group buys, what have you, actually require you to have a set of data to operate on rather than just a single piece of data. So having this mechanism in place makes the system generally flexible. We use this specifically for tracking latency through the system. We've actually engineered uh, the system end-to-end -to, -end to measure latency within every component, and we use this windowing uh, metric to aggregate this data and visualize it in our program. So the actual performance that we get out of the system on a 600 uh, gigabytes of RAM cluster, this is about, I think this was a, a 10 node cluster at the time, is that we're able to process 70,000 records per second with an average latency of a quarter millisecond, well within our latency window. Now, the more relevant question here is what happens in the worst case? And that's why we have these percentile measurements here. And in the 6 nines case, in the 99.9999% case, our worst case measurement was still 6 milliseconds. So we are doing quite well as far as simply measuring latency there. Now, the bigger question is, OK, I've talked a lot about this notion of having durable independent pipelines. Let's actually prove that this works. Let's prove that we can feed in a bunch of data through the system, look at how many individual pieces of data take longer than our latency window to generate a response. Because you can imagine we have three independent pipelines. Whichever one responds first, we can essentially take that answer, say, great, we have a response, we'll send that upstream. And what we found is, after feeding five million pieces of data through, that we only had 39 of those records it exceeded our latency window of 16 milliseconds. And that fraction actually works out to be a success rate of five nines, as we needed to show. So we have now, we've demonstrated that we have a technology that meets our latency requirements. We've shown that we have a technology that meets our availability requirements. And the last bit, and this is something that's presently in the works, is that we need to show that any piece of data that enters the system leaves the system. And to that end, we generate a unique hash for every record that comes in. And we then compare against the hashes generated at the output to ensure that all the data that came in is equivalent to the data that came out. So, so whoever produces the first answer, you run with that, and then you're done with that. That's the notion. And the reason that this isn't formally defined is that this isn't actually something we've yet gotten back from the rest of the business. Mm -hmm. So essentially, the upstream consumer of the response that we generate, their operational paradigm is un is unclear. Like we ultimately feed back to IBM MQ, what IBM MQ does with multiple pieces of data is undefined. So like it's not like it's clearly articulated that uh, it will take the first response and append that. It's this is something that the rest of the business has not yet provided to us as a requirement. 
So to that end, we're working still in sort of this at least once paradigm. Now, Apex does support an exactly once approach. This is based, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, on the windowing mechanism. Um, but essentially, over the course of a window, you can ensure that you get exactly one response for every piece of data that comes in. So it is doable in the system. Our approach was always either A, the IBM MQ upstream will be fine with having multiple equivalent responses to a single incoming transaction, or B, we add a layer at the front that has a very strict heartbeat on it that will take the first response it gets and pass that upstream um, or uh, return without a, fail without a success. So we consider this, we haven't had to implement it yet because we haven't gotten a strict sort of definition of what we actually need to build from the business. So you assume that all of your processes are deterministic, so the two pipelines produce identical results. Yes. This not is always the case. not always the case. Mm -hmm. we, we, however, do not. First of all, we're not dealing with stochastic systems in terms of the features that we generate. So, if we're getting different results from the operations that we're doing, there's a bigger problem. Um, the the other bit is that having two pipelines, if you have two different answers. You can't figure out which is the right answer. If you have three pipelines, then you can make a better estimate, right? So now we're getting into coding theory, but there there's. There's options there as far as. Particularly if you're in the pipeline, you're looking at some other database. Mm -hmm. class. So the state of that can change out of your control. So the two pipelines are going to hit it at different times. <coughs> uh, great question. So to, to reiterate, the question is um, we have an in memory data store. If we have these same pipelines hitting that database simultaneously, are they going to be out of whack? And the it's a really good question. The answer here is that we don't actually deal with that circumstance. The reason for that is that within Apex, we're able to explicitly control how we partition the data in flight. So we explicitly <coughs> define the partitioning scheme such that the same operators will always see the same pieces of data for, for example, for every account, right? And so what this means, um, in addition to uh, this data being partitioned, the uh, now's a good time to actually dive into what we're using as a memory store. and. This, uh, this HDHT that's built on top of uh, DataTorrent, the way that it works is that every, it's essentially a way for the memory space of every operator to be stateful, meaning that in the event of a failure, it's durably restored, and for it to be persisted to disk over time. Uh, the consequence of this is that no, there is no uh, sort of uh, multiple pipelines hitting the same database. Each pipeline and each operator has its own memory space that it's using to store data. Um, and so we never have this conflict where we're competing for access to the same database and we have to worry about concurrency issues. So the two pipelines that they have, each one of them has its own partition of the data That's right. Separately. That's right. It, and yeah. by virtue of that, this never becomes an issue. In the case where we initially built this on Redis, right, totally would be an issue. And uh, this is one of the reasons we moved away from Redis, along with other issues that we ran into as far as scalability goes. Now, long term, I did mention we don't want to be dependent on a proprietary solution. We are in the process of defining what does a next gen in memory database look like that'll serve the needs of this project, and are actually defining what that would look like and how we would build it and ultimately open source it. So um, that is actually a presentation. So we are at the question section, so that's great. <laughs> Yes. So, uh, did, you, did you try Redis cluster at all, uh, rather than Redis itself? I'm sorry? Uh, did you try Redis cluster at all, or uh, did you try Redis cluster uh, rather than just Redis? Uh, we, yeah, we, so we were running a Redis cluster. We, we scaled from uh, a single Redis node to three Redis nodes to ten Redis nodes. Um, Performance-wise, Redis actually does great. Like it's, uh, we, we ran the same benchmarks. We only saw maybe a one to two millisecond degradation in terms of latency to Redis. Um, the, the downside with Redis is that we would see GC pauses, um, which meant that our, our long tail would uh, kind of grow out, right? So our percentile, um, our high end percentile measurements were not as good. So we have more records that exceeded the latency window. And the other sort of challenge with Redis is that it has this client server model where at the end of the day, everything is going through a single server that's being replicated to the clients, and what happens when that server goes down 
how do you dynamically reconfigure things without downtime? Right. Um, so that's why HDHT is sort of a better solution. Sorry, yes. Yes. Uh, any questions on the webcast? We have about 30 people there. Any questions? Quiet crap, I'll take it. No, no, no. Actually, I have a question. Sure. Uh, what's the HDHT API uh, that you are basically just, just, are you just using it to store the state of, oper uh, checkpoint the state of operators or are you actually using it to, uh, as, a, as, a, as a destination for your data? Mm -hmm. uh, we're using HDHT as a key value store to store features associated with an account. So anything that we need to maintain an aggregate for, we define a, uh, a key function for it. Um, that goes into HDHT for each operator. So the memory space associated with a set of accounts will store the features associated with those accounts, and then we can quickly do lookups on those and update those as new data becomes available. So the same account may be stored multiple times because it's used by different operators? Yes. When we're replicating data, each of these three pipelines will see... So you're not updating the account as you go through the stream? But in what sense? The account record or not? Yes, we are. Then there are multiple copies, then how do you keep them in sync? There, uh, there is no, I guess, uh, your question is what if the three pipelines get out of sync with each other? No, so you've got three outbreakers, yes. all of them report. They're doing something with their account record. Hmm? So you say you've got three, co three copies of that account record per outbreak, right? Not, not per operator. So again, oh. each there is a physical separation. So uh, logically speaking, we have three independent pipelines. Yeah. Each of those three pipelines sees a copy of a single record for any one transaction. And we take the first response for that specific transaction that we get out. So the state of each of those pipelines will be in lockstep because they're processing the same data at the same time in yeah, order. Yeah, so okay. This, uh, okay. Yeah. Hope oh, that helps. Um, <clears throat> did you consider SAMSA? Uh, we did look at SAMSA. Um, we, the, the main sort of a strike against SAMSA is simply that it's built on top of Kafka. Kafka is back to disk. And that complicates the sort of situation of uh, recovering from uh, failures. Granted, the, uh, this notion of parallel pipelines totally uh, is fine in that case. Like, SAMSA is arguably a pretty appealing technology. We didn't evaluate it explicitly. Again, relatively young, relatively small community, relatively focused uh, support, right, only really deployed at LinkedIn. So um, it, it was on our radar. We never did an explicit evaluation of it. Um, we had you know, three good alternatives. We have limited resources. We can't look at all the things. So we knew of it, think it's good, didn't use it. Any questions from folks on the webcast? No. Okay, cool. Thank you.